to Soul Blazing. I'm Lisa Haysha. My guest today is Emmy-nominated actor, activist, environmentalist, and entrepreneur, Harry Hamlin. Great to see you. Oh, thank you so much for coming today. Pleasure is all mine. You are someone I really admire because not only are you the sexiest man alive, you, you know. are, you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you ask my wife, she might have a different story. Okay, but that's, that's interesting to me because the more I get to know you, you have so much depth to you and you're so, you know, intelligent. So tell me a little bit about your journey. You started off in theater. I did, yeah. I, um, I kind of became an actor by accident. Um, I wanted to be an architect, but I got into a little bit of trouble before I uh, had to uh, register for my architecture classes. And I was going to Berkeley at the time. And um, when I got to Berkeley, finally, after the trouble that I got in, I didn't have enough time to register for the architecture classes and ended up uh, only having time to register in the acting department. And so I took four acting classes that satisfied my, my first quarter's requirements. And one of them was uh, Acting 101, and I had to audition for all of the plays. Uh, it was part of the requirement. And uh, I auditioned for the first play, and I got the part. And from that moment on, I just did play after play after play, and I never had time to do the architecture thing. And, and uh, here I am. Yes. So what a great <laughs> What do you think um, you had inside you to be able to succeed so fast? I mean, a lot of people go try out for acting or they have this big dream and they can't seem to get any success or very little success. And it seems like you didn't even want that career and you had such great talent and discipline. Well, I think discipline is part of it. Yeah, yeah without question. Talent is questionable when it comes to me, but on the other time, I mean, I think if you work hard and you dedicate yourself to, to something, and I've discovered this later in life, you can learn almost anything. Mm -hmm. I, I did Dancing with the Stars a few years ago, and I mean, I mean, there's no chance that I could ever be a dancer, and I somehow managed to pull off the first day without vomiting on the stage. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then I, I, I was asked to do a play on Broadway a few years ago, a, a musical, Chicago, on Broadway, and they never asked me if I could sing. Like Those three words, can you sing, never came from the other side. And, I, and I, I said yes to it, of course, immediately, thinking that, well, they must think I can do it, or maybe I can learn to do it, or whatever. But I did, in fact, within a few weeks, with enough discipline and, and enough dedication, learn how to sing. And I could actually do it on Broadway when it came uh, opening night. Wow. So can you take us through those steps? What do you do? How do you discipline yourself? How do you learn something new? Uh, oh, my goodness. I, you know, I, Pretty much everything in my life is new and always has been. Uh, I don't, I've never been an expert at anything and, I, and uh, I, I'm sure that I never will be. So I approach life as a freshman on every level uh, when it comes to whatever endeavor I might be taking on. Uh, I'm a neophyte. So it's, I've got to learn from the ground up everything about it and then try to figure out some way to get from point A to point B without falling flat on my face. So I think it, maybe it, may, it could be fear of falling flat on my face that makes me go deep into something and make sure that I know everything about it before I actually have to reveal what I'm doing. It could be that. Um, but I think it's also that if I'm going to do something, I want to do it to the best of my ability, uh, and whatever that may yeah, be. Yeah, but for people out there who really want to achieve something, as a life coach, I hear a lot of clients come in and say, I want to do this, I just, I'm not good enough, or I'm not talented enough, or I just didn't get the right breaks. What would you say to somebody like that? Or well, what can they I do? would say that that sounds to me like sort of a victim mentality. And, uh, and you know, we create, in my opinion, we create our life um, through our attitude uh, toward life. And um, I think respect for life goes a long way toward giving us the impetus to be able to do things well. Uh, I think it really, a lot of it comes down to that. I mean, we take so much for granted uh, as humans, in the, particularly in this day and age, when we live at a time when we can, if it's cold, we can turn on the heat. If it's too hot, we can turn on the air conditioner. Uh, we can get on a plane and we can fly to Paris for dinner if we have the wherewithal. You know, we can shut out the world if we need to. We can, we can in, 
entertain ourselves endlessly on television and with movies. I mean, we're, we live at a, at a time of human existence that's quite extraordinary in terms of our, the, our access to things. And so we, when we grow up in that time, we kind of go, wow, this is just the way it ought to be. This is the way it is. And we have these extraordinary devices that we can look up anything on and, and we have access to all these amazing things. When if you really drill down and think about it, and in the last few years, I've become obsessed with particle physics for some reason. It's, don't ask me why, but I am. And, um, and one, one of the things I found out, which is kind of interesting about, uh, about the universe, is that it is generally accepted that there are 10 to the 80th hadronic particles in the universe. A hadronic particle is a, a particle that has, uh, has mass to it, a massive particle, something that has um, gluons and quarks and stuff like that. So, there are 10 to the 80th of these particles in the universe, which is an ex amazing amount of particles. 99.99999 come practically infinitum of those, ad infinitum of those particles are lifeless, are cold, or unbelievably hot, or unbelievably separate. And they never coalesce into anything, much less into an animal or a life sentient being that could inhabit a planet like ours. And so the lottery that we won to be here, to have this tiny amount of particles that we're made up of become human beings at this particular time in history makes us so unbelievably fortunate that if we have respect for that and respect for the fact that we, we've won this amazing lottery, the likes of which winning are an impossibility, if we have that respect, then I think everything we do will be done with a kind of respect and love and awe that will make everything that we do, every endeavor that we undertake, um, the best that it can possibly be. Yes. Does that make sense? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so if someone's watching this and they're listening to you and they say, oh, Harry Hamlin, he's, he, Hamlin, he's so accomplished, what, can you give us like three steps something that is tangible for them to grasp of if whatever career they're going for, how do, like, how do you set up your days to win? If, how do you get that mindset? How do you get that discipline to do something? You know, I think uh, there, there isn't for me uh, a kind of a set regime. Mm -hmm. um, someone once said to me that uh, allowing life to happen is just as valuable as making your life be what you want it to be. I mean, I spent many years kind of ramming a square peg into a round hole, trying to make my life what I wanted it to be. Uh, and when I, sometime maybe 30 or 35 years ago, I read something or came to the realization that, that life was actually much easier than that. That uh, if, if I- Maybe think in the flow? Well, if I could be aware and be in the moment and go with the flow, that, that actually things just happen that are extraordinary. And if we take advantage of those things, if we see the opportunity in front of us, if we're aware enough and block out all the noise that's constantly dragging us okay, either that's into the, brilliant. That's the exactly past what it is. Yes. into the present. You know, we, we, if we come into the present, we don't pay so much attention to what happened yesterday or so much attention to what might happen tomorrow. What happens right here is just exactly the right thing. Whatever's happening right now is just perfect. And if we can go with that, somehow that leads to the next step. I don't wake up in the morning with a, a plan for the day. I mean, I might have appointments that I have to go to, but I don't say, I'm gonna accomplish X, Y, and Z today, or I'm gonna accomplish X, Y, and Z this month, or this year. I've never had a five-year plan, for example. Um, I imagine that if I had had those kinds of uh, long-term views about things, my life might be different than it is today, but I'm very happy with the way it is today. It's perfect. Well, it seems like your life is unfolding beautifully. It seems like what you were saying earlier, when you allow things to happen, and I think when you do drown out the noise and it, you're just present, for me, it's meditation. If I meditate in the morning and really focus on just being in the moment and let each day, I agree with you, let it unfold, have loose goals, like I'd like to do something like this in the future, but not hammering it every day. Because somehow when you're obsessed with yourself, 
and just, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. You miss out on so much more and the miracle could be sitting right there, but you're looking over here trying to climb this mountain of your goal when if you just went here, you would get it easily and effortlessly. If you listen. If you listen. And it comes down to, I think, listening. And, yes. and I, I have an anecdote that I can bring to this, that in 1980, I was at a, living in Rome, in Italy, and with my son's mother, Ursula Andrus, and we, she's Swiss, and we went to the Swiss consulate one night for a cocktail party. And uh, I happened to not speak Swiss Deutsch, and I happened to not speak Italian at the time. And I was in this large room with people, and there was another guy who walked up to me, and he said he had heard me speaking English, and he said, I don't speak these languages, but I speak English. Can we talk? And I said, well, of course. And he happened to be a, a Serbian nuclear physicist who had an idea for a new way to make electricity that was pollution-free and non-radioactive. And it sounded way too good to be true at the time, but he was so excited and so enthusiastic about this that I couldn't stop listening to him. And in 1971, when I was at Berkeley becoming an actor, the kid living across the hall from me had come in one day and he'd said, listen, my dad works for the National Science Foundation in Antarctica, and he's just written me this letter, and, and the, in the letter he says, I can't tell anybody what they've discovered, but they've discovered that we are on the brink of a major climate change. And this was because he had studied the polar ice caps for so many years. So the kid went against his father uh, in the letter, who said, don't tell anybody. He told me anyway. Um, so I knew, I had in the back of my mind, I had this notion that, that the planet was heading for a kind of disaster, climate-wise. And when I ran into this guy at the Swiss embassy in Rome, he was talking about how this new way to make electricity would help with this new climate thing that might be coming along. And I put two and two together, and I, I kept in touch with him for the next 10 years, this Serbian nuclear physicist, who moved his entire operation from Princeton, New Jersey, where he had been working, to UC Irvine. He then asked me to be on the board of, of a company that he was forming. I said, I'm an actor. I don't do that. I'm not a businessman. I shouldn't be on a board of anything. But he said, oh, please, just come, come and be on the board. It'll help. And I went to the very first board meeting. And when he said, he said he had a very thick Russian type accent. He said, how do you listen? He says, come to the board meeting. I want to introduce you to your fellow board members. He said, come, come. He said, listen, first I want you to meet uh, Dr. Murray Gelman. Murray Gelman won the Nobel Prize for discovering the quark, he said. And I go, my God, uh, this is the Nobel Prize winner. What is he doing here, you know? And he says, he says, I want you to meet Dr. Glenn Seaborg. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering plutonium. And he runs the Atomic Energy Commission. And uh, I go, well, this guy, what has he got? He's got something here. Well, it just so happened that because of that conversation at the Swiss Embassy in 1980, I ended up forming a company which is now the leading privately funded fusion energy company in the world. And it will... Yeah. Yeah. This, this company will undoubtedly change everything. If we can achieve what we're hoping to achieve, and I've been working on this now for some 30 odd years, mm -hmm. if we can achieve this, uh, we will get the world off of fossil fuels, we'll, we'll have unlimited, clean, cheap power for the next 10 or 15,000 years on the planet. Now this is all because I was listening at a cocktail party and I heard the guy and I could have been looking around the room to see who else was there, I could have been looking at the pretty girls, I could have been doing all kinds of other things, but I listened to this guy. Mm. And that's what caused this uh, whole evolution of this thing to happen. So go to getting back to you know, how we achieve stuff, it's, it comes down to, I think, being in the moment, being available, being aware and listening. Mm -hmm. So what is it like to be in a family that you have two daughters yeah. also, right? And your wife is Lisa Rinna. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is yeah. that? How do you manage a household? Both your daughters are very successful now, too. Top models. They are, yes. um, and you know they didn't uh, set out to do That's that. That's what I was going to say. Either. Did you teach them? What, how did that happen? Uh, they, you know, there's this new thing called Instagram, mm -hmm. you know, and, and <laughs> yep. And uh, so <laughs> my daughters grew up with that, mm -hmm. and they grew up with um, with posting uh, on Instagram, and they were discovered by people who followed my wife, and then followed them, and uh, and then they, as a result of that, they uh, they now 
are represented by uh, like the best modeling agency and they're working all over the world and they're pretty self-sufficient as kids. But the, the thing about, you asked about my family and, and my family life, I got unbelievably lucky because I met this woman, Lisa Rinna. You know. Yes, that's sweet. How long have you been married? We, we've been together for 20, 25 years, married for 20. And, and that moment in my life, uh, I think, was the golden moment. Uh, and so, I mean, we, when, we, when we, we hit upon these moments in our life, and it, by the way, I did not think it was when I first met her. I didn't fall instantly in love with her. Where did you meet? We met um, not far from here at the Beverly Glen Center, which is a... She was, at the time, not working as an actress. She was running uh, the night shift at an eyeglass store, and she was turning the keys into the owner of the store, who happened to be a friend of mine. And I was having dinner with him, and she brought the keys to us. That's how we met. So it was an extremely fortunate moment, but I didn't know it at the time. I was not attracted to her initially, immediately. Our first date we had was horrible. Um, you know, we both, we, I kissed her at the end of the date, and, and she said it was the worst kiss of her life. <laughs> and I said, she said it that was on the, the spot. I, I know, we, we now acknowledge <laughs> okay. that it was like for both of us, mm -hmm. it was like a, just a terrible kiss. And it was a, you know, you expect that after such a bad moment, you probably wouldn't get back together, right? Mm -hmm. But we did. I, I actually, I chased her around for a while. Um, but it, it, Why I, did I, you chase her? If well, I, I saw something, saw something in her. I saw something. Mm -hmm. She was unlike the other women that I had been attracted to in my life, most of whom were much like my mother. And I was kind of working out some old mm -hmm. historical <laughs> stuff with those <laughs> Like, those I'm done women. with that. Yeah. No more. But I kind of, yeah, I kind mm -hmm. of recognized that in, in Lisa there was something new and different and much better. But I had to work at it. I mean, it took work for me to just rip apart the sh and rip to shreds the old paradigm in my mind of my ideal love object, which was mm -hmm. someone who much, much more re resembled my mother in, in attitude, in looks, and in sound, and all of that. Uh, so to, to sort of rip that apart took a lot of work. And that, what I realized after years of working with Lisa on our relationship is that love is not something we fall into, because we say we fall in love. That's a very passive idea of love. We actually make love. And you choose love. You choose it. You choose and you it. make it brick by brick. It's something that, you know, you, you put the first brick down, you put the mortar on it, and you put the next brick down, you put the, and it's, it takes work to make love. And, uh, but once you make it, it's strong. Yes, if you could withstand all the downs and really be there for each other and forgiveness and go through the hardships, then it's beautiful because you've been through so much, so exactly. then you could take anything. Exactly. But you have to choose it every day. Every day it's, you know, it is a conscious choice and it's effortful, mm -hmm. it's not passive. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you give to your daughters? I said to them when they were young, quite young, I took a glass of water and I filled it up. And I said, imagine this glass of water that inside this glass is the most important thing you will ever possess. And they said, well, what's that, Dad? And I said, that's your reputation. Mm. I said, now I'm, I'm going to make a mistake and I'm going to dump the water out. And so the water went down on the ground. And I said, now try to put the water back in the glass. That's how precious your reputation will be to you as you grow up. And I said, there's a lot of minefields out there, a lot of ways that, particularly with social media and with the internet and all the things that we can text and write and that, are, that exist forever. I said, yeah. just continue to imagine that that glass of water is the most precious thing you will ever own. And don't dump it out, because you'll never be able to get it back in the glass. And they, they, that, that hit home with them. And they have, they've lived their lives in a, in a, in a I think, for this day and age, in any case, a, a very um, mindful way when it comes to that. I also told them, whatever anybody else thinks of you is none of your business. That's a very important lesson. And that's been, I've been yes. drilling that in for you. Yes. Yeah, so you set them up really for success of really be mindful of what you do, mindful of what you say, mindful of who you hang out with. 
because all of those could impede on your reputation. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, reputation is, it's very hard to put that water back in the it glass. Is. You it know, is. The toothpaste doesn't go easily back in the tube. Yeah, and when you're beautiful and you're young and you're modeling, there's so many opportunities every day. I modeled in Tokyo back in the day, and every night it was partying, and there's something, everyone offering you things, so many opportunities right. to, you just had to say, no, you know, I don't want to do that. And that's exactly. very hard to do when it's, you know, you're a clan, you're a team. Then you get teased and picked on, oh, why don't you want to go out? Oh, come on. I know. It's just I mean, constant. the peer and pressure it's for worse. them, it's, it's unbelievable, the, mm -hmm. the peer pressure. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the device that they carry with them at all times, you know, can be an extraordinary benefit, but also is a is a minefield. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, so they they they're mindful of that. But you know, I I I don't expect them to go through life without stepping on a few mines, as we all have. Yes. You know, and in a, in a way, that's kind of how you learn. That's how we learn, as long as it isn't too big of a mistake. Exactly, yeah. and you clean it up right away. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So what's something we don't know about Harry Hamlin? You've done a lot of interviews, you've been out there. What's something we don't know about you? Um, you know, I, I, I was talking to Lisa last week about, um, about how the, ones, the impression that, that the public might have of somebody can be completely off and different from who somebody really is. I'm really, um, I'm really kind of a mountain man. I mean, I'm a... Uh, uh, I'm much more at home uh, building a fire in the, in the woods than I am uh, wearing a tuxedo and going to a, a fancy dinner. Yet, if I were to comb through the internet and look at most of the photographs that are of me on the internet, they're all of me in a tuxedo. So I go, uh, somehow, that's the image that stuck, the, the guy with his briefcase and the tie and the tuxedo. But I'm, uh, I'm much more of, a, of an outdoors person. I think that a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, when I was Googling you before I knew you, that's all I saw. Oh, Mary Teresa Renna, and I thought you were a playboy before that, and I thought right. you know, just <laughs> love parties and, like, like you said, tuxedos. And as I got to know you, it's a completely different person. And I think there's something beautiful about that because you hold something private for you, and you're doing so much work with the environment, and you want to share a little bit about that? We have a well, few I minutes think left. That, you know, the main, uh, the main thrust of my environmental work has been to figure out a way to mitigate climate change. Uh, and the thrust of that has been, you know, uh, advanced fuels, non-radioactive fusion energy. So if we can solve the energy problem, then we've gone a long way to really solving the, uh, the climate change crisis, um, it, it, which can't be solved, actually. The train has left the station. Climate change is going to happen. The feedback loop is already in place. But we can adapt to it, and we can adapt to it either well or not, and we can mitigate, we can mitigate well or not, a new energy source that is completely uh, non-toxic and cheap and available to everyone at an industrial scale level, which is what I'm working on. Uh, and this, there, I'm, I'm not a physicist myself, but uh, the company that I created, the guys there are all amazing physicists. and and engineers and they're working on it and uh, should they uh, achieve that then the environment will benefit greatly unbelievably from that so that's how far really away it. are you from that success you know they people always say fusion is 20 years away mm -hmm. um, we've been working on it now the company I started was in 1998 um, our best guess is that within the next five years we should have a working prototype um, and so that would place it about 25 years from the moment we started it. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's hope five years. Yes. In five years would be great if we, if we had it in five years. Absolutely. Well, I wish you the best of luck with that. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you so much for joining us today. Harry thank Hamlin, you. thank you so much.